Welcome to Neighbor to Neighbor. My name is Lynn Corm. I'm your host today, and today my guest is Mara Williams. How do you do? Thanks Good for to coming. S well, great to see you, Lynn. Yeah. Really appreciate you taking time out of your life. I know it's become really busy. It's always been busy, but it's. I think now you're getting busier all the time. I am getting busier all the time. Uh, part of it is the Brattleboro Museum is so production happy, shall I say. Um, so one show after another? One show after another. Because we're not a collecting institution, our entire effort effort is in exhibitions and educational programming um, and so we are doing on average 16 shows a road to uh, 16 shows a year oh that's a lot it's that's a lot a, that's it's every a lot. three weeks uh, well no actually it's um, we do three rotations and there mm -hmm. are between five and six shows in each rotation and some of them can be quite modest uh -huh. um, in scale Others are quite extravagantly large, and then sometimes we do the entire museum as one giant show. Mm -hmm. um, but, but basically, we're programming um, six rooms three times a year. That's a lot. Well, now you jumped ahead of me because I know your passion for the museum, mm -hmm. so I'm not surprised. Okay. But we like to start our show with you telling us a little bit about yourself. So let's tell people about Mara Williams. What do you want us to know about yourself? Because I know a lot of people know you, but I think chance there's one out there in our audience who doesn't. Well, and they may not know that I am a New Englander. I'm not a Flatlander. Oh, in, I do know New that. I am a New Englander. <laughs> uh, I actually am a Flatlander, but I'm not a New York Flatlander or Connecticut there's Flatlander. There's a distinct difference, of course. I was born in Dorchester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. to a large Irish, Italian, Portuguese, Scott Welsh family. <laughs> Okay, the melting pot? The melting pot. <laughs> yeah. And when I was 11, they moved us to Cape Cod, where my family still is. My mom is, is mm -hmm. uh, there. Four of my siblings and their children are there. And I moved back to Boston for a while, moved to London for a while, moved to New York City for a while, pursuing degree after degree after degree. And all of a sudden was offered a job in Brattleboro, Vermont at age 32 to be the director curator of an institution at least 10 years before any other institution in America would have offered it to me. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so why not jump at that and put that on your resume? And that's exactly what I did. And I moved mm -hmm. here thinking five years, maybe seven, depending on what the headhunters say. I'll just go to this little town. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. And I turned out to love it here mm -hmm. uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, I think that part of it was the challenge, part of it was the artistic freedom I was given by a terrific board of trustees and the colleagues that I met um, that, that, you know, we were all, all oars were pulling in one direction. Now, was the museum started, um, that you weren't the first director I know. There no, were several, there were several I before me. I don't remember me. exactly when it really got the building and got started. It's 40 years ago coming up. Our 40th season is coming up. And I came at year about 16, 17, something like that. <laughs> um, I remember doing their 20th anniversary party, but I didn't do their 15th. So, <laughs> so you know, there, there, you know, first it was this, hey kids, let's get together and put on a show. I don't know if you remember Helene Drool and Jean Randall. May they mm -hmm. rest in peace. Mm -hmm. They were part-time housewives and part-time running the Chamber of Commerce on Main Street and they decided we needed a museum and all of a sudden the Brooks, li the original Brooks Library was torn down and everybody's heart went like this. It was the most beautiful building on Main Street. Yeah. <laughs> and the next building that was slated was the Union Railroad Station and people were just appalled and what are we going to do? Uh -huh. And the selectmen were you've got to tell us what we're going to do with this building because yeah, it's want? a hazard. What do people want? And Mrs. Drool and Mrs. Randall just appeared before the selectmen and, and they put forth a very credible argument and Pal Borowski, who happened to be the chairman of the Board of Selectmen at the time, said, if you can get a group of people who want to do that, you've got to come back with a proposal and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, and the Pal Borowski thing, Donna, it, it had been Oh, she's the queen. This museum 
person now. She's yeah. the queen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she did two terms as president in the early and mid years, so the very early years and in the mid years, and she still considers herself our grandmother in some ways. Oh, I know. It's very dear to it's her heart. It's very dear to her heart. She still mm -hmm. serves on committees for us. She's um, not in the leadership structure um, anymore. She's a grandmother in truth. And in fact, at this point, of uh -huh. some teenage children almost. Wow. Uh -huh. um, so uh, you know, the, the Borofskis have always been um, supporters of the museum. Yeah. And, okay, so they got these two women got this idea to have a museum and got support from the community. But it's not a museum in a typical sense as far as when you think of a museum. That's true. And part of that is because it was two groups of people who came together. There was a group calling themselves the Brattleboro Art Center that wanted to do art shows and to have studio classes. And they already had a nonprofit status. Then there was a group who was very interested in history and wanted to do history shows. And there was no historical society in town at the time. So they formed an alliance, and they were going to be an art and history museum. And that tug of war went back and forth and back and forth for years, including under my tenure, uh, where I was producing history shows and art shows. We were only open part time. Uh, what happened is we more and more and more and more, because we were a non-collecting institution, which is the big difference. There are most museums that you think of are collecting institutions. We were charted and continue to be and continue to reaffirm that we are a non-collecting institution that uses objects. Borrow, bring shows in. And bring okay. shows in. And um, so we use museum quality material. But we don't, don't take ownership of it. We don't care for it. And we don't do the kind of research that a traditional museum would do. Art history research or historical research or material culture research depending on the type of museum mm -hmm. that it is. So we are non-traditional in that way. And what happened was about 10 years after the museum was started, a group of people started a historical society as the collecting endeavor. Mm -hmm. And we have a very rich collection, particularly photographic collection. So what was happening mm -hmm. is the collecting endeavor was going on in one place, and the exhibition endeavor paired with the art exhibition endeavor was going on in another place. And as that institution grew and became stronger and had more followers and followers who, who started having exhibition uh, expertise, uh, we converted to an all art institution, mm -hmm. basically. And um, keeping it going, keeping that going, how many people are, are on the staff down there and who, and who was all involved? Well, it's, it's um, let's see, let me count. I didn't count before I left because it was a much smaller staff when I was the director curator. Mm -hmm. I had both my job now and another job. Uh -huh. Seven years ago, they split the job in two and eventually put me under contract to do Curator. the fun half of the job <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, so we have a full-time director, a full-time office manager, uh, a full-time operations manager, and then we have the person who is the gallery and exhibition production manager who puts it who reports to me mm -hmm. on the exhibition production mm -hmm. side of the equation and all that paper the amount of paperwork that has to happen to safely guard and ensure everything is just phenomenal mm -hmm. and she also then runs the gallery upstairs and she reports to the director for that half of her job so there are four full-time people and then part-time is the building manager me mm -hmm. and the bookkeeper so it takes an awful lot to keep that going, that Absolutely. behind the scenes work, you just, you go in there and it's, the displays are up and you know that it took time to, if anybody's hung a picture, they know that that takes some, some doing. You know, I don't know if people realize between the conceptual level of what you have to do to put on a show that has some cohesion mm -hmm. uh, and that has some dynamic and drama, which is a big you know, I'm famous for saying, so the what's drama. the wow factor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to have the right uh, balance of scholarship and showmanship, to make all the loans, then to do all the writing and label production and loan forms, and to publicize it properly, to raise the funds to keep it going, to have due diligence on our financial reports. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an lot. extraordinary amount of work. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, it's um, I'm not I'm not involved in the museum, but I can appreciate all the work that goes into it. It's 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 a, it's a lot. It's, it's a big production. What you said. It's a big <laughs> production operation. Yeah. Um, how do they pick themes of what they're going to do? Who makes you're the curator. I guess you make that decision. I'm the chief artistic do you go director. All over I the scout place? constantly. I scout all over New England, uh, in artist studios, in collectors' homes, in galleries, okay. at other museums, so and no rock. And left then unturned. no left rock left unturned. Uh, and and also in the greater New York area, which is the nexus of the international mm -hmm. and national art movement. Occasionally, I borrow from. Father of Field, you know, an artist in Washington, D.C., or an artist in Philadelphia. And there are artists all across the country. There are artists all over Europe. There are a tremendous number of artists that I, you know, I, I don't work with mm -hmm. simply because the shipping and handling and trucking expenses are beyond what, Your budget is. what our budget could ever possibly be. Mm -hmm. So there's that, that level of me constantly looking, what are the threads, because our, our mandate is art of our time. And we interpret that broadly, second half of the 20th century to, to today, mm -hmm. uh, so that there's a, con that there's a context uh, yeah. for looking at contemporary work. So now, are you looked upon by artists as a way to expand their, because I've never seen a, uh, it's not like a, you go into a business and they have the art piece and they have a little number and you go check what the price is. Right. You don't have that piece going. No, because my piece is based on scholarship, connoisseurship, critical understanding of, so, of like the dialogue. So, kind of stuff? Pretty way. much, pretty much. You know, and, um, but it still benefits the artist to get their, their name be well, and shown before other people. And, and when you've got a museum show, even a regional institution such as ours, as opposed to the Museum of Modern Art or the Whitney Museum of American Art, mm -hmm. it means a person who's dedicated their life to the scholarship of the contemporary art world is saying that your work is exemplary in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, where there are, there are a lot of painters who are doing work. There are a lot of Sunday painters who are, you know, Sunday, allowing, Sunday you know, painter? well, Sunday painter, you know, people who aren't professionally trained, or maybe they took some classes as an they undergraduate. Okay. <laughs> well, because they've got another life, I usually know, okay. to support themselves, I think. They're okay. just called Sunday painters, Didn't who are that. tapping into their creativity and maybe doing, you know, quite, you know, beautiful work, there is a level of critical discourse, you know, about contemporary art and what it's saying about our society, what its intrinsic aesthetic worth is, what its extrinsic commentary is, that allows the intellect and the emotions and the spirit to all work together. That is exemplary. And we tend to show on the exemplary side of the spectrum as opposed to the other side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. well, uh, I, think you're, you, I think one of the successes is knowing what your mission is, knowing what your, your parameters are, and not trying to be everything to everybody. I think that's true. That being said, at, because we're not a collecting institution, you say, well, what drives you? We have a matrix that, that, that we've developed over the years. It's approved by the Board of Trustees. It's an actual policy. And I have to work within that matrix. So we, and it's always a series of balances over time. You can't do all of the things that we attempt to do every single rotation and in every single show. So for instance, there, there should be a balance between traditional media and new media. There should be a balance between uh, work that is rich and more accessible than something that is completely conceptual and um, out there at the, the leading edge of what can be defined as art and aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. And we try and balance those things constantly so people can say, you can, can come into our museum and just look at something and think, that's beautiful. I love being in front of it. it you know, it's, it's quiet. It's contemplative. It's marvelous and people can mm -hmm. say wow what's that artist up to and why and boy that pushes my buttons in a mm -hmm. good way or that pushes my buttons in a bad way and why do I have resistance to it and what is that artist trying to say to me um, and so so those are the kinds of things a, a balance between 
local and regional artists on one end of the spectrum and national and even international artists on the other end of the spectrum. We, we don't just show the top ten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, um, but you're also, that uh, the interpretation of, what, of where those things are is always fluid, so you're allowing all kinds of opinions to come in to the yes. process. Yes, and part of that is driven by an exhibition committee that meets once a month with me. As a matter of fact, I'm running from here to there. <laughs> <laughs> it's at 4 o'clock today. Uh -huh. And the exhibition committee... Are they all local people? Are all local people. Uh -huh. They tend to be artists. They tend to be art scholars. Uh, and they t or they tend to be people who are collectors people who have just a passion for art and ideas, they li lifelong learners, so they, they're not exactly my peers because they're not academics in the way that I'm an academic, mm -hmm. they're not running another institution, they're not another curator, but we have artists and crafts people here who have regional and even national reputations who serve on the committee. We have, um, I can think of two women on the committee who are very involved with collecting themselves uh, and have experience being on boards of other institutions, etc. A couple of them are board members too. That's part of the way a board committee works. Uh, we have a few top level uh, people working in, for instance, like the glass arts or, or pottery and ceramics. So in the commercial art world. And then we so have the different genres. Different genre. Mm -hmm. And then we have a few working artists who are also academics, faculty of Marlboro College. Let's put it, <laughs> we'll, we'll put it right out there. Yeah. The, the wonderful faculty of Marlboro College that uh, Well how lucky of, for them that there's a place to go so close to dip into this other arena and get into the practical world now the academic and apply their skills. Uh, well absolutely. Yeah. And it's I mean, you know, they have their their practice. You know, they are working artists. They have their studio practice, they have their teaching, but then they have this other place to go that the world of ideas is coming from a different, a critical point of view mm -hmm. versus an art making point of view or pedagogical point of view. Mm -hmm. It's also a wonderful way for us to meet people who are potential interns. <laughs> <laughs> Always, you know, connections. Well, networking. and young people, young people really, really do keep you fresh. They keep you on your toes. They keep you honest about what it is you're doing because you're mentoring them and they call things into question because they have the sensibility of another generation. And now that Mara has white hair, yeah. <laughs> we must listen to the sensibility of another generation. Well, it's not necessarily sensibility. It could be one of the questions that just like, you know it, but you haven't paid attention to it in a while and they, you know, that question gets you thinking yes. about that. And it pops up and they come from, their idea of new media is so much bigger than my idea of new media. Well, I can, I can see where you're going with that one, yes. <laughs> and, oh, and, but if that's where younger generation artists are going and that's where, where the public of a different generation finds things exciting, rewarding, rich viewing experience, how to make meaning out of this, you know, I have to take it seriously if I'm going to continue to work in art of our time and not ossify. Yeah, well, you know, and it started, I can remember the first break of that was when cartoon art became a big kind of thing and, and most people were saying, it might be a nice picture, a nice drawing, but it's not art. Well, yes it is. <laughs> and, and now it's totally accepted. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, as a very rich viewing experience, as an expression of culture. Expression of color. I just love the color of it yeah. all. Yeah. Yep. It's, yeah. And it's, um, there are some fairly sophisticated visual structures within yeah. the cartoon genre or the graphic novel genre. Is that what it is, graphic novel? Is that yeah, you know, it could they, I mean, car cartoons, not, uh, you know, know the, they're not really cartoons. Comics, but, uh, the and then there's graphic, stuff. and then there's graphic yeah. novels, uh -huh. um, and and of course the Japanese are leading the way on this in so many ways. Did you see? I saw on TV where they're giving concerts with a hologram figure dancing on stage in Japan. Wow. That's and she looks really good. <laughs> you know, really moves smoothly like a real mm -hmm. person, and this whole audience of real people, and she has a real band behind her, but then there's a hologram. The, and and they're cheering just like it's a real person up there. 
And I'm thinking, well, maybe are we morphing from we don't know reality from, you know, makeup world, but I don't know. And we may. We may be. I don't know. And, but, but somebody but is a creative force behind that. There is some, mm -hmm. there's somebody with a vision of how to draw that particular woman, how to photograph and make a composite of a woman, how to then yes. do whatever the special effects are to make her move a certain way and what the music is. So there are, there's, there's a, probably a team of creative individuals making that moment happen for that large crowd in an arena somewhere in Japan. Yeah. I'm sure we'll see it here fairly soon. You no never, never know. No doubt. <laughs> but, uh, um, now, the arts community is really influential in, um, in Brattleboro in many ways, uh, helping it grow, helping it be an attraction place for people. Um, but it also puts a, a pressure on the community to support yes. many facets. Would you like to speak to any of that? Well, it's a constant balancing um, act, as it were. Mm -hmm. I remember appearing in front of um, some committee um, uh, years ago when I was the director of the museum, long before people started calling it the creative economy, et cetera. Uh, just bringing some facts about you know, how many jobs this is, what are the spending multipliers here, what, what happens when a person outside of your community comes to town to partake in one or more cultural offerings and what they're leaving here in terms of the restaurant community, the gas, hotels. the hotels, you know, sure. whether it's a day trip or not. And you come back. The uh, you, you know, and, and, the and that that is a part of what you look at when you want to support culture within the context of, of your community. Um, and then there's the sort of nonprofit factor that, that all of us are writing checks to multiple organizations to support what it is that we want in town. I always think it's important to look at, at things on multiple levels. My, my first and foremost consideration with supporting the arts in town across generations is really the intrinsic question. Where else can you go as an individual, as a family member, as a member of a community to be in dialogue with no right or wrong answers. To just to have a place where your imagination, your intellect, and your spirit are exercised, expanded, can be joyous, can be frustrated, can, can be elated, can be moved to tears, and then have some sort of spirited discussion with either yourself or your spouse, or your child, or your class, or your next door neighbor. And what does that do for you to expand what it means to be human? That's intrinsic to what the aesthetic experience is. And do you want those available in the context of your community as opposed to going two hours to Boston to the Boston MFA, or four hours to Midtown Manhattan to get it? So there's your first question that you have to ask yourself when you want to become a member of an institution or if a board of selectmen is looking at it and says we're going to give nonprofit property tax relief to this particular organization, etc. The second is this, these various sets of educational things that come into play for young people in your community by having these sorts of things and for educators in your community. And then the third thing are what are all the residual economic benefits of having With this the in hotel, town. hotel, gas, that kind of stuff. All that sort of stuff. And I would think that what you just described is that perfect balance and networking of culture, business, desirability to live in an area that, that attracts people to an area. Well, in fact, needed, for but. years, Ms. Barbara Gentry would run down to the museum <laughs> and pick up brochures, etc., to recruit docs and their families here. Uh-huh. Yeah, she would... She would be on that they, same page. They, and even if they don't really want to use it on a day-to-day -day basis because their thing is hockey, mm -hmm. they like to know it's there, that they live in a town, they haven't it cut themselves that. off from a town, in case that's what the children are interested in, something to do when the in-laws come to visit who don't say, well, you're living in the middle of nowhere. You know? yeah. and, <laughs> um, and so it is really for executive and professional recruitment, mm -hmm. it's a good tool as well. And, you know, I think one of the things that really makes all that work is the smallness of the area and that it doesn't take you, you I mean, I can walk down to the museum. 
Well, you were very special. An in-town <laughs> neighborhood. But, <laughs> but even if you're driving from out of town, it doesn't take you long. Do, it doesn't take long, and there's no traffic. You know, it's true. I mean, that that's a real gift in many ways too, which makes it all doable and something you can do it, it, it even at the end of a long work day and. So well, and it's a life. wonderful walking town. Once you pull yeah. into the High Grove lot or our new parking mm -hmm. garage or, or down to, if the museum parking lot is full, Marlboro, Marlboro College, College Graduate yeah. Center uh -huh. has 250 parking spaces right down on 140. Yeah. And, they're, and they're working on Malfunction Junction as we speak. Yeah. Um, but then, just on First Fridays, for example, when the town floods with people, even in bad weather, you just, you can waltz from the museum to the, Vermont Center for mm -hmm. Photography, and then stop at Amy's and see somebody else's show, and then go to a Catherine Deanich's gallery, mm -hmm. and then you can wander into this restaurant, that restaurant, this gallery, that gallery. And the, the, when when uh, Sally of Tom and Sally's had her little folk gallery attached to her mm -hmm. chocolate business yeah. on, on uh, Elliott Street, she and then William Hayes of the Hayes Gallery yeah had this idea of starting a gallery walk. They came to me at the museum and like oh, two or three other those, people. They, they were the I prime movers. They That's pulled great. me right in on it when I was the director mm -hmm. curator. And we did the first one. There were six of us. And by the next week, there were 10 of us. And it stayed 10, 12 for a number of years. Last time I looked, there Everybody's were... Everybody's got one. Ev I, I mean, there were like gallery 38 <laughs> or 42. <laughs> what do you see as the future area in which uh, the arts are going to... What do you see? How will we... How will we continue to grow or expand, or will we stay the same? I think it will be at strategic alliances, uh, and that's being encouraged in the kind of um, grants that are being written now, and, and, and major, major donors want to see that, you know, for instance, we did a big drawing show or a big print show, and we wanted to do some programming, so instead of doing the programming ourselves, we call up the River Gallery School and saying, we're doing this, would you organize a sketch crawl, we'll cross-promote it, we'll, mm. you know, and so those kind of strategic alliances are, um, I think, very important. Okay. Well, thank you, Mara. This has been a great interview. My pleasure. And um, we thank you for watching. You've been watching Neighbor to Neighbor. My name is Lynn Coram. I've been here with Mara Williams. The Work curator of our local Bradbury Museum and Art Center, and we hope to see you on our next show.